Hey everybody, welcome to the Art of NFT Business. Uh, I am your host, Jonathan Goodman, and my co-host is Florian Velo. Uh, as we get started with this show, I just want to remind you that this is not financial advice. We are not financial advisors. Um, so uh, we have a little bit of uh, exciting news. We have launched our website, which can be found at trigonal.xyz. Uh, currently, we are putting up articles from the videos we've produced, but in the future, we plan to expand that to news and opinion pieces with merchandise and other resources. Flory and I have been talking about uh, what we want this company to look like in the future, and we'll be updating things uh, the more that we get into it. Thank you for all your support, and please visit us at trigonal.xyz. We have a great uh, interview. We have a great guest for you today. Uh, this week, our guest is Somi Aryan. Somi Aryan is a tech philosopher, award-winning filmmaker, author, entrepreneur, and a LinkedIn top voice. With a background in philosophy of science and technology, Somi describes her role in society as a transition architect. As humans merge with technology and society enters a new phase of human evolution, Somi works on frameworks to address the challenges ahead. Somi's documentary, The Millennium Disruption, has won three international awards. Her book, Career, her book, Career Fear and How to Beat It, addresses the future of work and the skills we all need to gain to survive and thrive in the age of artificial intelligence. As a speaker, Somi gives talks and workshops internationally on the impact of technology on society and the business landscape, the future of work, developing thought leadership, and digital transformation, both in marketing and HR. Somi is the founder of Smart Cookie Media, a modern day digital marketing firm for thought leaders and an investor and advisory board member of Norcor, I hope I pronounced that correctly, Bioelectronics, an exciting wearable technology startup. Somi's latest endeavor is FemPeak, a Web3 education platform where they prepare companies and individuals to participate in the ownership economy and the next generation of the internet. FemPeak is led by women and inclusive to everyone ready to thrive in the emerging world order defined by technology. Welcome, Somi. It is a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And I, as I was listening to it, I was thinking I should probably uh, start by saying that we are actually rebranding. Uh, we want to make sure because uh, because although we are inclusive and we want everybody to, uh, you know, work together towards this goal that we have, um, just because it's called FemPeak, a lot of times gentlemen don't um, don't feel like they belong. Um, so we are rebranding. I'm still working on the name, um, but hopefully maybe by the time that people hear this, we will have that and we can put it in the description for them to see. We really want to build something around the concept of alliance, you know, and, and male allyship and, you know, men and women working together. Tell us a little bit about the, the NFT project, how, how you moved into the NFT space, how you're utilizing this to give opportunities to women, and as you say, expanding that beyond women. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about the project. Sure, definitely. So um, the goal here is really bringing together people who have a passion for um, shaping the future of technology and, and how technology is uh, impacting, you know, this um, accelerated human evolution that we are going through. Um, I'm a big believer uh, in the fact that um, we are moving towards a uh, technological singularity. Uh, I think we are, this is, this is um, upon us, you know, we see all of the vol volatility that we see in the, in the markets, in the tech stocks, you know, the volatility that we see in um, everything that is in one way or the other impacted by technology. Um, and these are all signs that we are going towards a state of, um, you know, complete, um, transition to a, a whole new type of species uh, you know this is this is what I uh, I believe in as a, um, a uh, you know, as a transition architect and a tech philosopher, I do a lot of thinking about these things. Um, I feel that, uh, you know, what's happening to us right now 
uh, is as big as when we discovered fire and we were able to cook food and our brains changed. In a similar way now, our, brain, uh, our brains are changing because of the way that we are using technology. And uh, our phones, our computers, they are a extension of our brains. Um, and this is uh, the reason why I'm saying it's, it's being accelerated and something really big is, uh, is about to happen is because by, uh, by all accounts, um, it appears that by 2029, we are more likely uh, to um, reach a state of um, AGI, you know, our, our technology uh, will be able to re uh, reach AGI. AGI is artificial general intel intelligence, and it's the time when um, artificial intelligence will become so uh, powerful and, and so smart that it can, in many ways, it can uh, supersede us, you know, or at, at least match us in many ways. And you can already see that. And then um, what's happening is that that is going hand in hand uh, together with blockchain technology and uh, genomics. So the combina combination of all of these things together, you know, is bringing about the possibility of a whole new type of um, humanity, um, you know, or human, you know, uh, like we go from homo sapiens to something else. Um, and, and I think we are going to see that in our lifetime. So this uh, really the NFT project and what we are building, um, the platform, the platform itself on a, on a surface of it is an educational platform, but um, the NFT project is really about bringing together enthusiasts about um, people who are not afraid of this change and who are celebrating whatever is happening with, uh, you know, and, and, and they want to actually shape on this uh, future of humanity, basically. So you, you know, you've, you've kind of evoked so many interesting ideas and questions that I have, aside from the questions that I had just standard questions. Uh, you sound like you're a fan of Kathy Woods. Um, would that be correct? Yeah, yeah, I love Kathy. Yes. Yeah, I, and we I actually would... already had on the platform. We had um, Angela Dalton who uh, advises uh, Kathy. So, uh, and I've interviewed uh, a few other people who you know are around her, and I'm hoping to get her. Um... Yeah, I'm I'm a very big fan of hers. I you know she gets so much negativity and hate on Wall Street, but she really understands that. Yeah, you're not investing for today, you're investing for tomorrow. And so many of uh, the Wall Street boys just don't understand the the impact that the technology is having, particularly, and I'd like you to speak to this, you know, I, I talk about this all the time, the, the repetition that we're seeing, I was in the dot coms and the pre dot coms. So I was, you know, I was working with the static HTML until we got dynamic databases and everything like that. I really see an amazing repetition happening in web three. Do you do you feel that as well? And can you speak to that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, it is happening. And this time it's happening a lot faster. Um, I'm not wanting to be a conspiracy theorist here, but I do feel like um, governments uh, and big tech are somehow trying to, uh, to slow it down a little bit and partly probably because for practical reasons of being able to cope with it, especially governments, because they just don't know what to do with all of this. So, so I, I do feel like they're trying to slow it down so that they can get their head around it. And because it's got incredible ramifications for you know, the job market, the, um, the fact that uh, because of this incredible speed of um, uh, technological advancements, a lot of people are going to be left behind. Um, there are a lot of people who are just not going to be able to, um, to catch up, right? So, so governments do need to slow it down a little bit so that they can find solutions to the social um, upheaval. And when I mentioned the singularity, so the actual singularity, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if you know Ray Kurzweil, you know, uh, by, um, you know, by accounts of Ray Kurzweil, well, he wrote the book, uh, The Singularity is Near, he's written, I don't know if you know that, but he's written another book called The Singularity is Nearer, and it's coming out next year, I've already pre-ordered it, and um, basically by his account, he's, he's um, 
uh, predicting the point of singularity being around 1940s. I think it's I think it's fascinating without me even asking you about the singularity that you immediately went into that. You know, mm -hmm. a, a lot of people, first of all, a lot of people don't understand what the singularity is, right? And then when you present the idea to them, they get very nervous. Uh, you know, they don't, you know, they, they don't, you know, when I when I look at the internet, the the 1.0, 2.0 version, I, I ask the mom question, is your mom using the technology, right? So when my mom got onto Facebook, that said to me, okay, we've now jumped the shark, we are at the top peak, everyone is now going to integrate into the technology. And we don't really have that with, with, with Web3. Web3 right now is those are those rudimentary, you know, computer computer science nerds, we're all sitting down and we're typing, you know, smart contracts and doing things like that. And we need to get it to that next level where it's integratable with a larger society. You know, uh, you know, for somebody to go in, you know, I, I talk to my family all the time, just buy one Bitcoin, just buy one Bitcoin and back it up to a, 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 sm a hard, you know, cold storage wallet. And that just goes over their head as soon as I say, okay, well, you need to get on to preferably not an exchange, preferably you buy it through your cold storage wallet. But, you know, these are the steps that you need to do. And it's just too complicated for them. So right now we're in this, you know, rudimentary time of Web3. And it's really those companies that are going to be able to integrate people into the, the, the Web3 environment that are going to win. And, and one, of, one of the things that we're trying to do here is bring up the education level, right? So, you know, a lot of people, when I speak at universities and, and you know, other, you know, availabilities to speak, you know, I'm talking to a very naive audience that is really hearing about Web3 for the first time. They don't really have that kind of insight as to what the larger, you know, scale of everything is. And I just, you know, I, everything is rolling much faster, right? So we just had this whole lunar crash. We'll be talking about that later in the program. Uh, you know, these are amazing things that are happening at such a rapid speed. They're happening in days instead of months, right? In the, in the Web 1.0, we used to gather together for conventions. And every time you gather together for conventions, which was like three times a year, you would have this advancement in technology and then we would all implement it. This is happening. You have to be on Twitter. You have to know that this stuff is happening so quickly. It, it's really incredible. So now kind of take us through that journey of what your project is in the NFT space and how it's going to onboard a lot of people. So um, one of the things that I'm seeing quite a lot in the NFT space is that the NFT community only talks about NFTs. You know, like for example, I have a Moonbird, I'm in the Moonbird um, channel, you know, Discord. I, I have um, a few other, um, you know, NFTs where I'm in these communities. And the majority of people are speaking just about their NFTs and the price and like the market. I think it's a it's a bit of a shame because these are people who are the most technologically advanced. You know, this is I, I would really like to attract uh, and, and uh, to get the NFT community to think a little bit bigger and think about the fact that because they are more technologically advanced and they they have already created their wallets, they have already, you know, uh, gotten their head around, you know, how, how this works, they should be the people who are going to take the hands of the other people and, and you know, uh, bring them up, right? And it's not just about creating a wallet and getting into Web3. It's about thinking about the bigger picture of the future of humanity. Um, and this project in particular is really... Um, uh, aimed at, at those people, because it's much harder to get people who are not in the NFT space. It's too much of a big step to for people who are not in the NFT space or haven't created their wallet to get them to think about all of these things and then go and create their wallet. Like it's just too much of a big step. So I think that if the NFT community 
um, starts to show interest in things other than just their NFTs. You know, I, I see NFTs as a means to an end, not, a, not an end in themselves. You know, it's like for me, it's a way that you bring together uh, communities of mind, uh, like-minded people, but also create a cross-pollination between these communities, right? So this particular um, NFT project is really focused on bringing together people who are interested in this whole concept of the singularity, how it's happening. And also it's a, a community that's passionate about bringing women along, you know, so it's not just, it's not like another women PFB because we are going to be releasing another uh, follow up to this that you can only get if you have the first one and they are male PFBs and, uh, you know, 90% male and 10%, uh, you know, other genders like you know lgbtq etc so um so the uh, idea of this is to kind of and, and um, the second project is going to be called allies and the, the idea is to create this alliance you know the reason why we started with with women in this is because women are always left behind in anything to do with the you know with uh, deciding the direction of the future of humanity so i wanted to make a, a point by kind of starting it with women and then bringing in male allies um so so that's that's what this project is but but in my lifetime and the things that i'm building it's really about onboarding more and more people into uh thinking about look this is where the future of humanity is going i do believe that we can't bring everybody along you know this is like i'm just thinking statistically it's pretty much um impossible it's very very difficult to bring everybody along because um uh i think the majority uh, just like today, the majority of people don't think about the macro and, you know, the bigger, um, like not everybody wakes up in the morning reading philosophy and, you know, most people are, are like just trying to get on with their day to day life and that's okay, but there's going to be about, you know, five to 10% percent of, percent of humanity who are going to be in the driving seat, you know, and shaping the future. And that's my target audience and with the rest of humanity, you know, that, that's also um, very important, but I, I, I can't uh, affect everybody, right? I can at least focus on, you know, my focus is on like, you know, working with people who are already kind of ready for it, or who are on the verge, you know, maybe they're in the top 20% of thinking about these things, but not yet in the top five to 10%. And I can help them, um, you know, transition. That's why I call myself transition architect. Uh, and, and I'm right in thinking that the utility behind the NFT is actually being part of this Femme Peakers group that is going to educate the the uh, that's right group. yes so it will be part uh, part of being it's about being part of that group we are bringing in some of some really amazing speakers some of the, you know some people that when when you get into these um uh you know these sessions you will get to you can raise your hand for example we had laura shin you could you know just raise your hand and come to stage and talk to laura shin directly you know like we've had camila russo we've got some really amazing people coming in and our members have got the ability to not just chat but they can actually raise their hand and come onto the stage and speak to those people directly so so we're creating opportunities for these incredible connections uh i've got for example i've got zeneca coming on my podcast so i will also have him on the platform you know so it, it's like gives our members the uh direct way to ask questions of um you know some of the top thinkers in in the space and not just in the nft space but also in other areas as well for example we've had professor sarah seeger who is one of our actually shareholders she's a, an mit professor of astrophysics so these are the kind of people that we are bringing on to the um, to the community that's great florian you had a couple of questions yeah uh it's been super interesting to go to like listen to you two because well i'm still learning like singularity and all those things uh, i'm really curious because like you say you want to try to bring a lot of people in um, and then, of course, we all know that NFT space is kind of like a niche. How do you plan on like spreading the word out? I know you have a big following on, on, on Twitter and, and other, other social media. You have that, that, that website as well. But how do you plan on bringing those other people that are on the verge of being converted? Because I know like I play soccer. I talk to my teammates about sometimes what I do and they just laugh about it. Oh, it's so cool. Like, did you see the next job? But like they don't really care about it. And how do you, how do we, how can we bring them on board? That's, that's the difficult part. 
Yeah, that's actually a very good question. That's why we have also got a normal membership, uh, which is, and, and uh, you know, the platform, that's why what it goes on on the surface of the platform, like if you go on the homepage is different from when, what you see when you go into the NFT page. So we see our NFT community as being like one step um, uh, maybe closer or uh, you know one step ahead of everybody else so there will be like normal membership you know you can have an annual membership where you just go in to learn about emerging technologies you know more like practical uh, things where you upskill yourself and reskill yourself and learn about uh, about these things and then there are people who are going to be nft holders who are like basically if you think about it like another tier so there will be some specific um IRL events and you know things like that that only NFT holders will have access to um, and uh, essentially we see our NFT holders as being like the guide for the rest of the members um, and uh, I think this is the way that we will create like a more accessible you know just like a typical you know uh, life, lifelong learning platform um, where people can come in and kind of learn about emerging technologies as lifelong learning but with a focus on emerging technologies okay yeah no uh, that's super interesting and it's always been the hardest part in, in, in this space just to how to bring th those new people in and uh no really interesting and and i also so i looked at uh looked up at the nft and then who, who's your artist because i i seems like to be like the the picture seems to be one of the picture of yours that's what jonathan was telling me uh when you were in a metal band yeah, yeah. So it's a picture of me when I was in a metal band. We, we have uh, the artist is our in-house um, artist. You know, she's also our uh, filmmaker, editor. She's just really, really, um, uh, you know, talented. And we work together on all the color palettes, and so all of the backgrounds are based on uh, different planets in our solar system. Um, so we wanted to do something a little bit different to a lot of the typical kind of what's accepted in the NFT space, because usually what you see is either they're kind of like very flat 2D, you know, um, uh, style of uh, very, very kind of colorful, uh, like if, especially if they are female, you know, a lot of pink and, and uh, things like that. Um, and then, uh, it, or the other way is like, you go down kind of like an anime Azuki type thing. So with these ones, uh, we, we went for something quite different. Like they are a little bit more similar to a picture. So we've taken that picture and, and it, it's got those kind of hues and, and um, uh, you know, shadows that you would see in a picture. And then like, for example, this one, the background is earth. Uh, and if you if you look at the original pictures of each of the planets, the, the color palette uh, of each planet, it like if you put the Earth, you know, picture next to it, it looks so similar. Um, I think my favorite is, for example, Pluto. You know, these are um, uh, so, th so that's how we've come up. And what we like about, uh, you know, the way that we've done this is that a lot of our um, members who are already, so our premium members are already getting a free airdrop before we have an official drop. And um, what they what we, what they really like is that they feel like it actually looks like them. So, so that we've tried to create this in a way that's kind of as realistic as possible. So for example, a lot of uh, our members like they when they receive their NFTs, they're like, this really looks like me. And they uh, it, it, we wanted to create it in a way that like, especially if you look at mine, for example, it really looks like me. So we've tried to do a similar kind of thing. And also we've made sure, you know, to in, uh, include, you know, people like, for example, you see the Indian, you've got the, you know, Muslim, you know, we've, we've tried to be as realistic as possible with these ones. Tell us a little bit about the, uh, that metal band. Yeah, I used to be in a death metal band. Uh, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it was called Mortad. Um, we did really well. I was on the back cover of Metal Hammer magazine. You know, we played to, uh, you know, 2000 people in Germany. You know, we toured uh, the UK and Europe. Um, and it was a lot of fun. Um, so when I first came from Iran, so I came to the UK uh in 2005 um as a student and then i uh, i was i studied in st andrews university i created the band first in scotland and then when i moved to london i recreated you know like uh, put together the, the new band members um and yeah it was uh, like i was a lot of 
um, I, you know, I had a lot of uh, anger, you know, and, and frustration having come from Iran. So a lot of my, um, I, I used to be a very angry person, you know, and it just like, I think that I really kind of the, the band really helped me get that aggression out, you know, because when you, uh, when you've come up, when you've grown up in a very aggressive and, you know, in a very kind of oppressive environment, you have a lot of, uh, you know, pressure built. So, um, yeah, so I, um, I got all the aggression out and then I wasn't angry anymore. And I think a lot of times what happens to people in metal bands is that, like, say, for example, I think about people like Marilyn Manson, for example, right? Like they, they start out with a lot of aggression and pain and they, that, they create their best art. And then when they no longer have that aggression and pain, you know, when they're, they start to get famous, they make a lot of money, you know, then they don't have aggression anymore. And then it kind of isn't authentic anymore. And, it, it, and then it starts to go downhill. So for me, the moment I felt like I wasn't angry anymore, I just gave up. Well, it, uh, you still, I'm sure the music is still out there somewhere. People can, can yeah, 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 yeah. You can go to YouTube. You can check it out. Just put more tat. Um, you know, all the, all the bands, uh, all the uh, music comes out. Comes yeah, well, I, I certainly relate to the anger. I was a very angry 20 year old. So uh, I, I completely relate to that. And, and tell us a little bit about the, and I know I probably pr mispronounced it, the Neurocore Bioelectronics company that you're involved in. So Neurocore Bioelectronics is a, a wearable technologies a company that I invested in. Um, again, you know, because I'm so interested in technology. So it's, uh, it's about how you, um, you know they use waves uh, to uh, help you with pain management. Essentially, oh. very interesting. Well, thank you so much, Somi. We really appreciate you. you being on the show today. Uh, you know, good luck with everything. We will continue to support your NFT project as you get ready to launch that. Thank you so much for being on Peace. the show. Bye. 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 Well, that was a great interview, wasn't it? Yeah, it was awesome. Like, she's really passionate about what she does. Um, we probably could have talked to her for like another half hour. Yeah, that was that 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 that, that flew by. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, so we've got a lot to talk about. There's a lot that has happened uh, in the space. Uh, the Luna situation. I, I, so you've you've been super busy, super super busy. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been it's been tiring, and I kind of like with with what's going on in the space. We've talked about it. It's been kind of overwhelming for me a little bit. So I kind of like take took a step back and and watched from far without trying to like interact with everything right now. But it's yeah. true that when you're on Twitter or when you know people in the space like the Luna, there are things being like really massive. Yeah. Um, yeah, tw Twitter is, is is fascinating to me. You know, I've been on since it started. I, I created an account like, you know, within the first year that they had launched, but I never really used it to this extent. Now I'm on it all the time. And what's interesting is, you know, everybody has these large audiences, right? Like, you know, people are being followed by, you know, th tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. But then you have this ability in Twitter to get notified by, you know, who you want to get notified by. And I just find that if I'm not, that I have to very carefully choose who I'm getting notified by in what they're put, putting out there. And in fact, it's changed for me over the last couple of months. You know, I used to, you know, get tweets from like 40 different people and now it's really really narrowed down because those people are the people that are really giving the the right information and you know that's why i'm following them but this whole luna thing is just incredible you know you know let me just kind of pick up on where i wanted to kind of take us in this conversation so it turns out that this Luna was this Luna crash and UST crash was a deliberate attack to show the instability of algorithmic stable coins. And so I'm going to explain a little bit about what that means to our audience and then we can kind of have a conversation. So there are two types of stable coins. There is a reserved back back a reserved backed stable coin, which is collateralized backed to the dollar, 
which means that every dollar you convert to the USDC is backed by a dollar in a physical bank somewhere and you can always exchange it one for one and an algorithmic backed stablecoin is not like that it's just the underlying asset but instead there's an algorithm that keeps the digital dollar at the price of a US dollar and now UST was on the Terra blockchain network but the goal of the team was to make UST the preeminent stablecoin on all blockchain networks so there was plenty of liquidity for UST on the Terra network but not necessarily as much on say like the Ethereum or Cardano or Solana networks so this made it easier to initiate a short attack on UST, which then caused a crisis of faith by the holders of UST and thus Luna. So basically there were two entities, two people, we'll get into who those people may be, within a 24-hour period that sold over $400 million of UST, withdrawing it from the Anchor Protocol, which is the main yield protocol of the Terra network. And I'm sure I've gone over the heads of a lot of people just by saying that. But just understand that there were two attackers. There was a short attacker, number one, that withdrew $226 million from Anchor. And there was a short attack, number two, that withdrew $190 million from Anchor. And both happened within a 24-hour period. And what that ha what that caused is a cascading liquidation effect into the whole system. So the creator of Tron, now we're getting into who may have been responsible. So he has a he's a competitor of Luna UST. So what he did was he bought a bunch of UST and that kind of alerted the Terra team and then that's when this Justin Sun who is the creator of Tron said that you know he may have a secret plan going on so now i have to add in another fact here so about a week before the attack the creator of terra ust whose name is do Kwan, bought a large amount of bitcoin as a precaution so whoever sold that bitcoin to do Kwan is also a suspect because they then received a lot of ust in that transaction so how did this all wind up so on monday may 9th ust lost its peg what does that mean so it means that it should be at a dollar but it fell to about a dollar it fell to about 95 cents and stable coins are supposed to match the us dollar so losing five cents is a really big deal then on tuesday may 10th UST continued losing value, and the Luna Foundation deployed capital in an attempt to stabilize the coin. And then on Wednesday, May 11th, UST dropped to 80% of its value. This created an arbitrage op opportunity. And for those of you that don't understand what an arbitrage opportunity is, it's when you can take advantage of a difference in price between two markets. Now, a lot of people in DeFi, in Web3, are doing this on a daily basis. They are looking for differences between the exchanges, and then they're making a ton of cash. So let's say, for example, just because a lot of people understand stocks better, let's say that Tesla was both on the NASDAQ and the Japanese stock exchange, which they are not. So Tesla is only on the NASDAQ. So because there might be a delay in Japan lagging the difference of sales by about 10 seconds, I could write a bot that says, when there is a big enough discrepancy in price between these two markets, I want to, I want to do an arbitrage system where I then buy on the NASDAQ and sell immediately on the Japanese market and I make the money between those two differing prices. It's very difficult to do. You really need a lot of good coding and bots to do it. But this is basically what happened. So, and so when UST traded below a dollar and was no longer pegged to the Luna, an infinite loop occurred and diluted the existing supply of Luna until it was worthless. 
$500 billion were wiped off of the market. Luna Foundation had to liquidate $1.5 billion of Bitcoin from its reserves, causing Bitcoin's price to drop below $26,000. That's a, that's a, that's a crazy story. It is. It is. The thing is, what, what for me, like that kind of like followed the story from far, like what's the, the relation between Luna and Terra? Are they not two different? So, How can so, one Luna, so Luna is the coin on the Terra network. So, you know, so here's, no, here's, where, here's where everybody kind of gets confused is that the coin on Ethereum network is called Ethereum. Mm -hmm. Right. But as more people rolled out blockchain, for instance, the Richard Hart project, the blockchain is going to be called Pulse Chain. But the, uh, the coin that is going to be the denomination is going to be called PulseX. So there. Yeah. So it's Luna is the coin on the Terra network. OK. All right. I'm but so it really it really shows that the algorithmic stable coins are not secure. Yeah. But then now from. From this, where are we where do we go? Like, is there a way to for for this like stablecoin to go back up? Is there a way like that they can uh, recover from it? Well, you know, there are there are a lot of people who've lost a lot of money, and they want to convince a lot of other people that Luna has an opportunity to come back up. I. There are, I have seen so many scams on Twitter and on YouTube over the last week about Luna, hyping Luna, how everything's going to come back. And I mean, look, you have to do your own research. You have to make your own calls. No one can, you need to be financially responsible for yourself. And there's, you know, I was even listening yesterday to really intelligent financial advisors and they asked him, you know, would you invest in Luna at this point? And this was a couple of days ago. So Luna was at a dollar and he said, yes, I invested a small amount of money in, in Luna when it got to a dollar. Now realize that it went from one hundred and two dollars down to a dollar. So that's where all that wealth got lost. But now it's at 0 0.0001 cent. So that financial advisor, even if he just put $200 in at a, at a dollar each, he's still lost. There's no coming back from this because at the end of the day, look, it's hard enough to get investors to fund projects, right? You know, everyone who is making money in the blockchain now is fortunate that they have investors that are willing, that are confident enough in the people that are running these blockchains to give them money. No one is giving Luna money. The no, no one with the financial. It would take one trillion dollars to bring Luna back up into a hundred dollar, a hundred dollar per coin mark. It's just, it's, it's not. It's not feasible. There are so many other things that you can do with your money. Uh, you know, and I would just say to anybody that there are a lot of scams going on now. People are mistakenly buying Luna in the hope that it will make a return. And I can, I, I listen, this is not financial advice, but you know, there's no way that this is going to happen. So there is a bigger issue here. A lot of people are just throwing their money out when they, you know, you know, look, we get excited, right? You get excited about the NFTs and I get excited about the crypto and the DeFi. We don't really know. There's, you know, you can only do the amount of, of research that you yourself understand, right? If you're not a financial person, looking at those financial, the white papers that are talking about the coins or talking about the finances, it may mean something to you. It may mean nothing to you. Look, there are financial advisors that you know, I've had conversations with, and I've walked away, and I was like, I don't think they understand a financial statement. Like you know, you just don't know. You have to take in. Look, you know, why am I invested in the Richard Hart project that's launching allegedly next week? Uh, you know, I he's a character. It 
was an immediate decision. This was, again, a, during a period of time that I was just throwing money into DeFi. I wasn't really doing that much research. Um, you know, all I put $1,000 into, you know, three different protocols, 300, 300, 300. Uh, and I've lost all that money. That, that money's not coming back. Those DeFi protocols are gone. Um, I put $300 into PulseX, and we'll see where that goes. Do I have faith that it's going to get to a dollar and I'm going to have $3 million? I don't know. But uh, am I okay in losing the $300? I totally am. What I'm concerned about is the mental health of people who have put their life savings into Luna and these other projects that, you know, look, you know, if you're sitting on a million dollars and it's in savings and you put a hundred thousand dollar investment in and you lose that hundred thousand dollars, you still have nine hundred thousand dollars. But what we're finding is that it's not those people. It's not those people. That's not how they're investing. They're sometimes taking their rent money, hoping that they're going within a month, flip that out and make, you know, $2,000 in their $1,000 investment. But if everything goes away and you've lost that $1,000, now you can't pay your rent. Now you can't pay your mortgage. Now you can't pay the grocery bills. You know, this kind of feeds into like a whole other mental health conversation. And, you know, you know, we really, you know, so look, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. I've had some successes. I've had a lot of failures. Uh, all of those are leaning, learning and teaching experiences that you kind of walk, work through. You're, you know, you're, you're an athlete. I, I can, you know, I only attend the games, but I can only kind of impose what I think goes on which is incredible highs and lows for you. And, and particularly, you know, your career, you've had major in, injuries um, that have had incredible setbacks that you've had to come back from. You know, your highs and lows must be, I don't know, you, you have to kind of like fill me in on that because I, I think a lot of people look at athletes and they just, we see this with Simone Biles, right? who had to leave the Olympic, you know, theater uh, in competition because of her mental health. And I don't think a lot of, I don't think people pay enough attention to athletes' mental health. I don't, I don't think so. Again, like I'm not comparing what's, what happened with Luna and what happening in, 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 in the sport industry for athletes regarding mental health, but mental health is a big issue. Um, it's an unspoken issue. A lot of people see athletes as they see them on television with some of the top athletes getting all the praise, getting all the money, getting all those like shiny things. But underneath that, it's just like the tip of the iceberg. Underneath that is so much work, so much dedication, and then a lot of pressure. Um, a lot of pressure that's being given by the player to himself, the pressure from the outside as well. Um, and social media hasn't helped with that because we've seen a lot of hate uh, going on like athletes being like rashly abused or abused mentally because of course like you I had that in New York Red Bulls for example when you played well well they don't say anything and then but when you play really bad you get those messages like you don't want to see that because like it just challenges you mentally and it's really difficult to get over with um regarding like uh, injuries as well like being sidelined for a few months almost a year it's it's difficult to deal with and and we don't want to appear weak i think that's the reason why we don't talk about it but i've overcome it using a sports psychologist and it's been super helpful and uh, and i'm an advocate for it i would love to help younger athletes to do it because it's important it helped me a lot. Um, that's the reason why I, I write as well, just to put everything into words. So I have like some kind of support and let all the emotions out. Um, but yeah, it's 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 hard to talk about mental health. Uh, but once you do the first step, like you you feel so much better uh, as, I, as I did with, with the sports psychology that I've been working with. But yeah, again, like those people that 
it's 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 so different because they invest their savings, they invest invest their life's money into a project that just turns out to be zero. And what do I do next? You know, and and this is in those moments where you need support. You need like you need to feel comfortable uh, talking about it with your family, your friends, even those that might not like understand what you've been through. It's important, like to have that kind of support. And if they are your friends, they'll be they'll be there to help you. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we should say that, you know, there have been eight unverified suicides due to the Luna project, the Luna crash. This was something that was mentioned uh, on one of the Twitter uh, business NFT uh, crypto channels that I watch. Um, Again, unverified, but still, you know, when people kind of go all in, what's interesting is like, you know, when we say like, you're, you're going all in, like, what does that mean for you? Because, it, you know, it shouldn't, it shouldn't, you shouldn't be risking your financial stability. When you, when you start to invest at a level where the risk is greater than the reward, and, and understandable, like Luna jumped up to a hundred and you know, some odd dollars. And so everyone was very excited. Now, look, you know, the Pulse X chain, uh, when that goes live, I have a number in my head that I want to extract out, right? There, There is a, I want to, it's not just, you know, make back the $300 that I put in, that would be nice. But I would like to take care of certain business things that I would like to, you know, utilize with that money. But that is, I'm only willing to do that at a fraction of the amount of tokens that I have. I'm, uh, and the rest are just going to be left in there for a very long time. I think a lot of people go in thinking, this is it, this is the one, this is the next Board Ape Yacht Club, this is the next Tesla, this is the next Microsoft or something like that. And they put in so much money, not realizing that, hey, if it is that successful, if you did put $1,000 into Amazon the day that it launched as an IPO, today you'd have multi-million dollars. You have to be able to wait and hold that out and then also go into the right projects. Obviously, you know, if you had invested $1,000 into Netscape, well, that money's gone now. But at some point, it did go up. You have to be happy in taking that out. But, you know, getting back into the whole mental health conversation, you know, I, I've experienced a tremendous amount of death. I, I, I wrote this in the notes. And, you know, I, I just don't know. At, at 50, 50, almost 52 now, um, I, there was a decade where, you know, my, my grandparents died, my 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 aunt died my some of my cousins died um you know uh, being in the lgbt community there have been a lot of people that i know that have passed away i've had college friends that have passed away i've had personal friends now due to covid that have died um it's a lot of death and it and it weighs on me considerably and it it uh you know you know you can I, you know, I had this kind of weird experience uh, um, about a couple of years ago. I'm, I'm not going to say how many years ago, where things had just completely fallen apart. I had a back injury. Uh, my long-term relationship was ending. Uh, my financial stability was questionable. Um, all of those happened at one point. And I... You know, being out of it now, I can kind of speak about what that felt like. And it, you know, I can only say that it's depression. It was depression now, now that I've been out of it. It's very hard to know when you're actually in like a depressed state. But I I kind of described it in the notes to you that, you know, I could be standing on a sunny beach and it could be a beautiful day and watching the sunset, but all I would visually see would be darkness. You're just surrounded by darkness. Now, in the case of these Luna suicides, I think that those tend to be more um, reactionary and they're not just like long-term darkness, depression kind of thing. But 
you know, I don't, I don't normally, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not introspective outwardly. I, I see myself for who I am and I can see it internally, but I don't talk about it a lot. This is actually the first time that I'm, I'm talking about it, but it's this amazing kind of bizarre thing that goes on, even with your eyesight, with your mental state, you just feel like you're in complete darkness. It's very hard for other people. You know, it's like the same with, you know, you have knee pain, you know, you, you have you have a knee injury, I have a back injury. You know, it's very hard to explain to people what that feels like. If you, you know, it's like giving birth. Like if you haven't given birth, you can't explain to somebody who can't give birth what that feels like to push a baby out of your body. And it's the same thing with depression. You, it's very hard to explain to somebody that you're in a depressed state because they will just simply say, oh, you know, do something fun, have something, you know, have a nice day, go and have an ice cream, go take a walk. Um, and it's not that. It, it, there is a physical element to depression that really manifests, at least for me, it manifested in seeing everything in a gradated, dark, fog it, it, it was quite, quite incredible yeah it's 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 something that you can explain because it varies from people to people but having been through that as well like you don't want to do anything no matter how good it sounds I mean, how good like people want you to do something you don't want to do it you just want to be by yourself usually in a dark room and then just like but then again it's a negative spiral like you you start doing this and then you it's really hard to get out of it um, I had to get into like a big, big fight with my mom. So like she, it's things snapped and be like, okay, well, I have to do something about it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's difficult to get out of it, but like, it's not that hard if you have the right support and you can take that into your own hands. And there's like a lot of people that talk about it. There are a lot of people that open about it. There's probably a, a website or a line that you can call. That it's the, the, there's more and more help nowadays just to like get over depression or mental health issues. Yeah, you know there is in the United States we have a number. It's one eight hundred two seven three eight two five five. That's available twenty four seven, uh, twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. Or you can visit the suicidepreventionlifeline.org uh, to get help, and it, it's very important. You know, it, you know the the you know it's that it's that border between it's understanding that you need the help before you really harm yourself. And you know, I I've 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 been uh, I've I've been friends with people that have uh, committed suicide. I've had uh you know situations like that and you know it, it it's i don't know you know i it's very hard for me to say this next part because i understand how controversial it is but you know suicide is the worst thing that you could do for the people around you it is the most selfish thing that you can do because it removes you from the from the equation and it and it forever impacts the people around you you know they, they are never the same because uh of what your decision was to end your life and you know look i mean i wake up you know at, at, at 52 now i have to say I wake up every morning blessed to having opened my eyes and, and breathing air and being able to walk and, and enjoy this amazing planet that we have. No, I agree. And the thing is, like, taking your own life is just easy to just, like, kill your own pain, but then you're causing more pain to the people that stays because I am sure they are wondering, like, what happened? What did they do wrong? What can they what can they have done to help you? And I think that's the worst part. So it's just like thinking about thinking about the people that surround yourself might help you just get out of it. It's not easy, I know, but it's just 
causing pain to the people that you love isn't the thing you want like by leaving this earth so it's it's no. it's something you have yeah. to think about and people, I know people easy, don't but... don't see that this is something that you know you're going to address more on on the website on trigonal.xyz you're going to really kind of talk about what it means to be an athlete and tell us a little bit about what where's where that's going um so yeah like we, we've decided together to put everything into a website where we can share all the information that we do find that we have um like you've been like doing great production with the videos and i think having this in one platform could be great and it can give me another app, my own platform as well to talk about sp the sport industry and my journey that's been really unusual to the pros uh, my goal being like helping young athletes um in the development uh and and as we talk about it one of the topic i talk about is mental health has been really important in my success and in my life um, but there's a lot of other topics that I'm going to talk about. There's a bunch of stuff that are already ready because uh, my plan in the future is to put everything into a book or comic book. Um, but yeah, I think it's important to let others, athlete knows that, okay, like what you see on the field is there's a lot of work behind. There's a lot of like setbacks, a lot of like things you have to deal with and it's never easy but you can get over it like and then and then there's a way out if if you really want to because i turned pro at 23 it's not a young age um i've been through a lot of really bad injuries i could have ended my career if i wanted to and i'm still here so it's been a fun, fun journey and i want to talk about it and hopefully like empower other 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 people with it yeah and i think from a from a non-athlete perspective it's it, the focus is incredible right i'm i'm somebody who you know i'm kind of like a macgyver right i can learn to code i can learn to fix a car i can but i don't have a focus i don't have a specific i'm very good at a lot of different things but you're very very good at one specific thing that mental focus is uh is, is something that i'm very interested to see you get into from the website and the articles and everything like that we'll talk about metaverse players next yeah. week mm -hmm. uh just a, just a little hint to everybody uh about the metaverse players um it, it the launch did not go well um the floor has now dropped below the price of the original purchase even with the discounts um, they have not sold the number that they thought that they were going to. Uh, and I'm trying to get someone from one of the major collectors from one of the other projects to come onto the show and explain to us what's going on behind the scenes because it's not, it's not great. But I did want to talk about Gladi Knights. So uh, full disclosure, I am an advisor on the Gladi Knights project. Uh, their launch is Wednesday, May 25th. Now, due to the recent market downturn, they have decided to release a Genesis project of 1,000 NFTs instead of the full 10,000. They are going to release the remaining 9,000 in the future, but right now they are focused on satisfying the audience they have built. I believe it's the right decision to only release these Genesis 1,000 NFT projects. There will be added perks for collectors of the Genesis project, and Glotty Knights have a good roadmap. I believe in the team. They are dedicated to producing a long-lasting project with many features to come. And if, like me, you're an avid collector of NFTs, this is a good project to get into. Again, this isn't financial advice. Do your own research. But if you're not looking to flip and instead are interested in investing in good art with a good team, this is a project you should check out. If you like this content, please hit the like button and subscribe and add notifications. Thank you for watching. And if you can please add a comment, it really helps with the YouTube alg algorithm. Thank you everybody so much. We will see you soon. We have another, we have a couple of other great guests coming onto the show that we're excited about. Thank you guys. Bye. Bye, everyone.